Hey, it's Friday. You know what that means. It's time to deploy. I'm John and joining me is Jim. Jim, how are you? How was your week? Yeah, really great week this week. Uh, fun stuff with the team. New dog. Uh, New dog. Yeah. Oh, there you New go. Dog. Who's that? That is... Uh... His name again, Bronny. He's a new, Bronny new deploy. Literally, literally got him yesterday. You literally got him yesterday. I don't think we're gonna keep the name. So uh, okay, yeah, awesome. What kind of dog is that? That is a Neapolitan Mastiff. He's a, he's a pretty. But big it's boy. not. It's uh, not red. It's not red, white, and and green or whatever the Neapolitan ice cream is. You know what? Though? The tips of his paws are one of them's pink, okay. one of them's brown. <laughs> awesome. That's pretty so cool. uh, for those of you who are just joining us, this is Deploy on Friday. It's a show brought to you by myself and Jim. This is every Friday where we talk about the latest tech trends and news relative to Octopus. Uh, if you find, uh, find out more, you can go visit us on our various social networks, etc. Or you can just visit our webpage at octopus.com. Um, so we've got a lot of news to cover this week, so might as well just get started. So We'll flip in over to here. Uh, for those who don't know, we actually host a bunch of webinars from time to time. So um, we've got two exciting webinars that are coming up, one on June 22nd and one on June 28th. So the one that's on June 22nd will feature Ian, and he will be talking about managing tenants at scale. So this is talking about a specific feature to Octopus, which is multi-tenancy. Uh, it's a feature that a lot of customers use and use very successfully. And he'll be talking in particular about um, how to use them, how they work. And then uh, he'll also show off the new redesigned uh, tenants dashboard that we have built into Octopus, the latest version of Octopus, which is going to be really cool. And then the second webinar that we have is a new webinar that we're instituting on a monthly basis called the Community Town Hall. I've got a bunch of folks that will be joining me for this. They will be talking about a variety of things, anything that's relevant to customers using Octopus, uh, we'll also take your questions. And so this is going to be a great chance for you to talk to folks on the team. Uh, we've got a lot of folks who will be representing uh, product managers, engineers, etc. So we'll all be hanging out there and answering your questions and showing off some demos and having a, a fun old time. So that's the Community Town Hall, and that's on June 28th. So webinars are a coming. And we've already hosted a couple uh, this earlier this uh, year, last month. And uh, so we've been having a good time with that. So Make sure to check that out and register today. So good stuff there. Awesome. Uh, so for those wondering what uh, the new redesigned tenant dashboard looks like, this is the old one. Um, but I did this interview with Ian where we talked about the newly redesigned tenant dashboard. And he actually went through uh, an example of what it just looks like. This is a video that I published today up on our YouTube channel. So you can go to our YouTube channel and check this out where Ian shows off what the new redesigned tenant dashboard looks like. We also have a blog post on our blog that talks about this, which you can find at octopus.com slash blog, which is cool. I like the new tenant dashboard. I don't know if you do, but I think it's pretty cool. What do you think? No, it's awesome. I mean, tenants is such a powerful feature um, and yeah. it really needed the UI to, to, to match it and unlock that power. So I think it's great. Uh, uh, it's pretty colors too. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, so definitely worth checking out. If you just want the quick run through, you can go check out the video that I posted today uh, up on our channel, which is great. Speaking of our blogs, we have a new blog post by Isaac talking about bicep templates. So in particular, how to deploy a bicep template step. And so bicep is uh, a capability largely espoused by Microsoft. Um, it's used for doing uh, configuration-based deployments to Azure resources. Um, so if you want to use ARM templates and you want to do so via a bicep template step, this is a feature we have in Octopus. You can check it out. So um, it this blog post basically shows you the step-by-step -step, uh, process of getting this configured. So basically you utilize the new um, deploy a bicep template step and then you set it up. And then once you're uh, got that all configured and ready to go. Um, you can go ahead and parameterize it, provide variables, etc., and then you can go ahead and deploy Azure Resources uh, to your will. So there you go. There are a new feature there for Azure deployments, which is awesome. Yeah, I've never used Bicep. Managed yeah, it's one, of, it's one of a few that are out there, uh, sort of config mm. language, um, text-based resource descriptions of uh, things. So definitely worth checking mm. out. Yeah. yeah cool. How do you? Uh, by the way, I have to say, how do you like the new the new look and feel to our website? It's pretty slick, eh? Yeah, I actually hadn't noticed it or known about it until you mentioned it just now. Yeah, it's cool though. It kind of matches the um the new navigation bar and the product as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So we've done a lot of stuff with our webpage. I wasn't planning on talking about this, but I'll talk about it anyway, because I've, I've been kind of helping a, a little bit on the edge about this, but we've been redoing our website quite a bit. And uh, one of the things that I'm really excited about is our docs page. So if you go to our resources slash docs, um, this is a new system of docs that we've built. It's based on Astro, um, mm. which is a really powerful framework based on Markdown, uh, statically compiled, etc. And the good news with that is that we can go really fast in terms of our doc generation. Um, so I'm really excited about this in particular, but it's all part of the sort of stuff that we're doing to the website. There's lots and lots of stuff coming. And uh, the latest one that I liked is obviously the new nav. So um, really slick. So there you go. Awesome. Earlier today, yeah, the SD Times. Sorry, what was that? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Earlier today, the SD Times uh, named us a leader in the DevOps space. So uh, I, of course, had to, uh, you know, uh, point out the fact that we we enjoyed this one. And so I, I used a little bit of uh, gift magic, but they had a best in show uh, sort of uh, review for 2023 and Octopus Deploy was in the top whatever list for uh, DevOps, which is awesome to see. So uh, this is something that the SD Times has run for uh, a few years, I think four or five years. And so we were recognized as a leader in that space, which is great to see. And um, yeah, got recognized up on Twitter. So that was kind of a cool little thing I saw this morning. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. So yeah, good little thing there. Um, this is a video that was done um, with a community on YouTube, the engineering community, uh, which is, I think, well, I don't know where this is based. I have to suspect somewhere in Europe. Um, but um, Bartos is a member of a, uh, a member of this community, and he did an overview presentation of Octopus. And so I thought this was kind of cool. I found this up on YouTube. This was posted about five days ago. So if you're all curious about getting the sort of high level 101 overview of what Octopus is and how it works, uh, we had a member of our community provide that example. So that was kind of cool there. You can find that up on our YouTube channel or sorry, up on YouTube rather. And um, yeah, just search for Octopus Deploy and you'll find it there. So there you go. Awesome. I like that. I like I like when other people demo Octopus. It's, it's kind yeah. of fun to see how they kind of kick the tires. So it's good stuff. Uh, it's all about it's all about recognition and and uh, placements and grids this week, <laughs> Jim. So this is the new uh, G two grid report for build automation. Now, I have to say, like build automation isn't exactly kind of what we do. We're kind of on the very edge of it. <laughs> I would say mm, we're we're kind of yeah. like um, we're kind of like on the edge of build automation. So, anyways, this is their newly published uh, grid for build automation. This is up on G two. G two is a a site that does um, sort of user reports and reviews and stuff like that. So um, you can check it out at g2.com. And there you'll get a bunch of reviews for a bunch of different surveys, uh, sorry, a bunch of different software products, etc, including Octopus. And uh, they ranked Octopus right here in the middle, we were ranked as a niche product, which is fine. I mean, like, but when in terms of build automation, like we don't do build automation, but I guess they felt so inclined to include us. So I'll, I'll take a shout out when I can. So there you go. So uh, there's a question here from Adrian, which is, is it on GitHub? Um, the I'm assuming the uh, thing that you're, you're referencing here is possibly the docs. And the answer to that is yes, those docs are available up on GitHub. Um, let me see if I can quickly find on uh, through the magic of software. I will quickly see if I can find <laughs> the repo. Uh, yeah, so here it is. This is uh, our docs page. So Adrian, here's your answer to your question. This is our public repo here. So this is slash docs, you'll find this. And uh, that's where we publish those things there. So thanks for the question. Great question. Awesome. Uh, cool. So yeah, so G2, um, always a fun sort of little interesting uh, journey through what people think. And so they, they put us right kind of in the niche category, which I was like, okay, fine. You know, we are a deployment tool. <laughs> so there you go. But anyway, AWS yeah, managed so to get on there twice. I know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, those are some of the highlights and, and things that I thought were interesting relative to Octopus. And we shall now move on to some of the industry news relative to that. So uh, Microsoft recently announced the C Sharp dev kit for Visual Studio Code. So um, if you've done any work with C Sharp in Visual Studio Code, you might be using something like um, uh, OmniSharp, which is a community 
uh, set of tools, an LSP for uh, processing C-sharp within the VS Code uh, IDE, or rather editor, I guess. And so the C-sharp dev kit is a new uh, VS Code extension that provides that same type of experience, but is, um, is a little bit better in terms of what it can provide. So it consists of the extension itself, um, and then there's the C-sharp dev kit extension. So to kind of get the summary of what's included, so the, the dev kit extension includes things like a solution explorer. So these are parts and pieces. Like, I don't know if you know this, Jim, but VS Code has a bunch of extensibility mechanisms. It's not mm. just the editor. You could extend like the terminal window. You can extend like the solution view. You can add yeah. all kinds of things like to the LSP, um, the language server uh, protocol. And so there's lots of things you can do in there. So uh, native test explorer integration, um, and then the C Sharp extension, fully open source, excluding debugger. Um, it's an evolution of Omni Sharp, which is the one that most people would download um, anyway when they would when they would when it said, "Do you want us to turn on C Sharp integration in VS Code?" Yeah. It would always say, "Turn on Omni Sharp as well." Uh, it just made sense. Uh, rich editing experience, uh, and then there's IntelliCode for the C Sharp Dev Kit. This is the AI stuff that Microsoft has. This is um, the everything is great. The only thing that I've heard from the community is that it's all, it's all licensed under a VS um, subscription. So you have to have yeah. a subscription for VS in order to use that. So. so is the old extension going away that you don't need a license for? Uh, OmniSharp? No, I don't believe it is. Yeah. I think it's just a replacement of it. But OmniSharp is maintained by the, the open source community. It is heavily mm. sponsored, I think, by Microsoft. It's, at least that's my, my recollection yeah. of it for a long time. But uh, yeah, so this is, this is new. Mm. <laughs> that is a hmm i'm not sure what mm. the <laughs> yeah um, i mean i get yeah why why not so it, improve omni sharp <laughs> i know i know well i think it's because omni sharp has its goals in mind and yeah. some some of the goals that i think are um uh, with the c sharp uh dev kit are a probably superset of those goals and so yeah. things like the Solution Explorer maybe fell outside the bounds of OmniSharp. I think OmniSharp was always meant to just be code-centric. language. Wasn't, yeah. yeah, yeah, pretty much. So managing ex managing projects with a new solution view. Um, so they're kind of taking those parts and pieces that you see in VS and bringing them to VS Code. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. What's that? I, I never had a problem with the File Explorer in VS Code. No, it's more than that. It's like it's also project templates. So you may it yeah. goes by pretty quick. But one of the things you'll see here is when they say um, in this in this movie GIF, uh, they'll you'll see in here all the project templates like, right there. Bang! All those yeah, are okay. all those are project templates that you would typically see when you say .NET new the com the command line, and so you'd see yeah, those yeah. listed there as as an example. So yeah, uh, test your projects with expanded. Uh, test Explorer capabilities. So with the C Sharp Dev Kit, you could, your units, uh, your tests in X Unit, N Unit, MS Test, and B Unit will be discovered and organized. Um, this is very similar, so you can barely make it out here. Let me, I can't, I can't do a really good job here of showing this, but that's about as good as I as we're gonna get. But um, there's a um, test runner that I use for TypeScript um, that does this very, very similarly, and it's exposed through the so this, you see this little beaker here? This is the, the yeah. testing capability of VS Code. It's always there. And you could always run unit tests on a per method, per class, per um, file basis, like a, a group of files. Same thing, basically. Um, but they're they're kind of unit test agnostic, framework agnostic. Yeah. So, yeah. The current C Sharp experience with this is not great, though, is it? No. <laughs> no, it's not. So this is a yeah. little bit of an evolution of that. And the, the um, command line runner is not fantastic either. So no, there's no, some it's real not. value there in that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. I agree. So, I mean, all this is good. I mean, like, I, I think, oh, I yeah. think it's easy to poo-poo this stuff, but it's, um, this is, this is good stuff. So, experience improved performance and reliability. So, the C Sharp Dev Kit is powered by the recently updated open source C Sharp expansion. Now powered by an LSP host also open source. So this is the thing that people, I think, um, when they look at extensions for VS, VS Code, for VS Code, for Sublime Text, for um, even, I think, even um, Rider and the various JetBrains IDEs and all the IDEs subscribe to this LSP protocol. So LSP is, this language server protocol is basically a spec. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. It's kind of interesting. 
Um, it's basically a spec that you can implement. And then what this means is that when you implement this, it means that your extension from not the host, but not the host for the extension, but the extension itself, the, the, the guts, the plumbing is pretty much um, extension or sorry, editor agnostic, which means it can be shared. This is the this is the power of having a protocol. Now, the way this works is you just do message passing between the host and the um, language server. So in this case here, if I'm writing a C-sharp language server, uh, let's say I don't like OmniSharp, I don't like the C-sharp dev kit, I'm making, I'm making the Octopus <laughs> language server, um, then I would write something like this. And I can use a variety of languages to do that. In fact, one of the things that we did um, inside of uh, Octopus itself, you'll find this up on GitHub. Uh, I don't know if many folks know this, but there's actually an extension for VS Code that we wrote. Um, and we built a LSP for this as well. Let me see if I can find here on the other side of the fence, the, re the repository for this. So this is the repository of the VS Code extension that we built uh, for VS Code. And this is a basically a, um, an, an extension for VS Code that understands OCL or Octopus mm. configuration language. And so it's exactly the same thing. It's it's basically that plumbing that provides that implementation. And so when they talk about the uh, language server protocol implementation for the C-sharp extension, that's what they're talking about. They're talking yeah. about that implementation there. So write your project faster with an AI powered, uh, basically back end, I guess, if you want. So auto installing as part of the C-sharp dev kit. The IntelliCode for C-Sharp DevKit extension enhances the AI-assisted support beyond the basic IntelliSense code completion found in an existing C -sharp, in the existing C-Sharp extension. So we're getting some ability to <laughs> let, like let the computer write its own code. IntelliSense uh, had a love child, perhaps. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I know. It's, intel it's, it's, it's more intelligent. It's, our, it's, AI, it's AI code. So code telesense, yeah, yes, something. that's right. Yep. yep. We're gonna uh, let AI well. come up with a name as well. I know. Well, it just okay. let it give, yeah, let it, and then just let it work on itself. Yeah. I think there yeah. are, I think there are interesting projects that are doing that. Yeah. Uh, getting started. So you download it, and then it's got um this new start page. So I don't know. Some people like this, but it's got a new welcome page. You can write your own welcome pages as well. I don't know if you knew that, but you can do that as no, well. So this is the um the blog post that talks about this from Tim Hewer, who's a member of the team, and uh, definitely worth checking out. So if you're using VS Code, uh, definitely go have a look. Great stuff. All right, I know you're really excited. It's happening. Kubernetes, mm. Kubernetes community, um, community Days Australia, it's coming. This was posted yeah. earlier today, actually. So the Kubernetes uh, Community Day rolls right off the tongue, or the KCD Australia 2023 uh, is happening uh, in Sydney at the ICC, and registration is now online. So for folks who are watching this overseas, apologies, but uh, we're having one down here, down under. And um, yeah, definitely worth checking out. So I thought I'd just mention that. I saw that. Was, I was like, oh, cool, you know. Finally, we get a little Kubernetes Day action down here in Australia. That's great. Yeah, nice. This is a blog post that I thought was really interesting. This was up on the GitHub blog. Um, this is applying GitOps principles to your operations. It's a bit of a mouth word, a mouthful, mm. but um, I love how they pose the question here. Could you? Could we use our Git repository mm -hmm. as the source of truth for operational tasks and somehow reconcile changes with our real world view. Now, the answer to this is yes. And the re and the answer to how you do that is GitOps. That's basically what GitOps does. And so what the author does here, Chris talks about is sets the stage for, you know, why would you want to do this? How does it, how, what's the idea behind GitOps, GitOps um, and uh, you know, the, the value in, in doing it this way. So first, what is GitOps? It's declarative, meaning basically you, you express your desired state um, declaratively in in in, case, in a case of GitHub in a thread, for example, in an issue. Um, it's versioned and immutable, which means that um, basically you're utilizing, you know, obviously the the notions of Git with branches, etc. Um, commits are immutable. You can obviously do um, you know certain commits, but um, basically, if you're you're standing up infrastructure in an issue in an issue that is done once and once only, and it doesn't you, it doesn't change. If you want, you can always roll it. You can always roll back in the form of changing state and applying, for example. 
uh, pulled automatically. So software agents automatically pull the desired state declarations from the source and then continuously reconciled. And so these are the sort of tenants around GitOps uh, with the principles thereof. And then in this article talks a little bit about how you can utilize GitOps in the context of something like Kubernetes. So the idea with Kubernetes is that I can basically provision pods and you know replica sets and setting up all kinds of rules and then manage all that within the confines of a Git branch and you know declare those things uh, as part of an issue if I so if I was so inclined. They do provide this sort of uh, nice view of the world here. So if you're at all interested, you can take a look at what this looks like. But basically, it's very similar to the way you manage infrastructure with Terraform, where you have this notion of state. So state management and state reconciliation and drift and all these other things. Um, these are things that are well known to us in the sort of um, desired state uh, world. Even with um, PowerShell, you can do things like this, right? Ansible, uh, Terraform, all these things have this notion of desired state. You have an automated process that will check uh, and reconcile the, the, the collision that could occur between desired and current state. And then you change that via GitOps through desired state changes that you commit through pull requests. And so the idea here is that I may update things like, let's say if I'm using, using Octopus, I may use GitOps, a, a style of GitOps to update my deployment processes, which are in OCL. I will then state those and then those will get reconciled back up as my deployment process up into Octopus. And so that's the idea there. So GitOps is nothing new. It's just it's it's kind of like a pattern which with which which people have actually applied these things. Um, and so I thought this was a really good way of of, you know, kind of summarizing this. It also goes into recommended practices that you can also employ as well. So if you're at all curious, you can take a look at those. Um, so yeah, I thought this was kind of like, if you're looking for an introduction or you're used to GitHub and you're kind of looking for something to expose yourself to relative to this world of GitOps, this would be a good way to do that. Yeah. It means a lot when GitHub, GitHub are talking about it too, though, right? As well. That's right. You know, it's a thing now. Yeah. That's right. It's real. Hey. That's real. Yeah. Um, I know that we use this to a certain extent. Uh, we do, we do a lot of this stuff internally for GitHub. We do, um, checks we do uh get operations etc we go it's sort of bi-directional as well so um there are things that we'll do for issue tracking in octopus to talk back to Oct to github for example and then we'll utilize commands in github like our github actions you know to create releases and deploy them etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's lots of ways in which you can mix and match this stuff and ultimately the source of truth is your your source control um, your repository for for source, which is why we implemented features like uh, Configus code. Um, but applying GitOps to this as a practice um, turns out to be really nice and really useful. So definitely worth checking out. Our friends over at Datalust are continuing on with awesome stuff. Uh, this is Seek, which is a great solution for um, log analysis, et cetera, um, super performant, really nice. These guys are based in Australia. Um, Nicholas Bloomhart is their founder and CEO, and I interviewed him for an episode of Inside DevOps, and so he was nice enough to talk to me about it. And what's really cool about this is that in 2023.2, they've added native ingestion endpoint for open telemetry logs. So one of the things that Nick and I talked about during our conversation, which was a couple of months ago, we talked about open telemetry. I was like, what do you think about it? Do you like it, et cetera? And he was like, yeah, it's pretty cool. So open telemetry is all about, you know, the sort of logs, traces, all the stuff that you would aggregate in terms of observability and metrics and stuff like that in a way that's kind of agnostic to um, the collection or the collector. And so it provides this sort of platform neutral, vendor neutral way of defining things like events and traces and things of that nature and so it looks like they now have native ingestion support for this in seek which is fantastic um and so um seek is is something we use um internally we use it for a bunch of logs etc it's super awesome for us and so now you now they support in 2023.2 the ingestion with open telemetry so if you define um an open telemetry cons uh, producer there's like this notion of producers and consumers and there's correlation IDs and all this stuff when you start getting into the uh, the guts of it. Uh, but now they have a ingestion endpoint, which is fantastic. And um, so you can 
start wiring this stuff up. The great thing about open telemetry is that it's super uh, well supported from a technology perspective. So they have .NET libraries, Go libraries, Rust libraries, etc. And um, yeah, it gives you a lot of extensibility there. So I thought this was really cool. I thought I'd mention it there. So I know you're a huge fan of comma delimited files, Jim. Yeah. This is possibly the world's fastest .NET CSV parser. It's known as SEP. <laughs> okay. So, <yeah. laughs> That's exactly the reaction I wanted. That was perfect. Okay. It's kind of like, you're kind of like Guilfoyle right. from uh, Silicon Valley. You're like, okay. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, I'd, I'd yeah. be proud of that claim, I suppose. Sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's just yeah. that sort of non-committal deadpan re re response that I would expect. So I, I feel like, I feel like the kick is still coming. Okay. No, no, there's no kick. <laughs> This is fine. Yeah. So SEP is a uh, relatively new library. Uh, it's a couple of years old, um, I believe. I think, or no. I just caught this. I don't know how old this is. Maybe it's brand new. I could be wrong. Anyways, um, it's utilizing some libraries uh, in the .NET space, particularly iSpan, Parsable of T, and iSpan Formatable. Um, these are relatively new interfaces that are available in the .NET framework and utilizing it in the context of a CSV library for .NET. Uh, library is called SEP, short for separator. And um, yeah, it's available up on GitHub. And uh, um, this developer here has shipped version 0 0.1 uh, and possibly the world's fastest. <laughs> so that's kind of quite a bold Maybe. claim. We'll see. Maybe. Yeah, we'll see. Well, well, it um, yeah, I mean, these these tools are great. I mean, like they're necessary um, because oh, they, they provide functionality that typically we don't want to roll ourselves. I don't want to roll my own CSV parser. And, no and probably sit at the bottom of a whole lot of very important systems around the world. Ex exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah. anyways, uh, if you're at all curious, if you're utilizing CSV libs, uh, libs rather, and uh, you, you're you not happy with the performance, I mean, this might give you an option. So there you go. Now, uh, I know we've been talking about, you know, just now common delimited, very hand hands-on sort of but uh you know the world as we all know is going towards ai and so there's a new term i want you to learn auto ops auto -ops. so <laughs> i know so we've, you've heard of GitOps. now here's auto ops so there's okay. devops GitOps, DevSecOps, uh infrastructure as code cloud ops ai ops etc list is growing is, growing is the is the implication that once i'm doing auto ops i don't actually have to know what i'm doing anymore this is the equivalent of next 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 finish so okay. auto ops is uh, basically the market is moving uh, to, you know, basically automate everything. And so um, this is an article that's just kind of it's not it's nothing. It's all vaporware at this point. But basically, yeah. um, you know, the full the oncoming full robotic automation world called auto ops. Uh, this will be interesting to see how that kind of happens. So I just thought this was kind of kind of cute and fun. So. Surely, surely we get to a point where we just get to no ops, right? Where it's That's right, like, no you ops. Know, you, don't have to, you don't have to do anything at all. It all just That's takes right. care of itself. That's and... right. And then you just compile it out because it's a debug yeah. flag. So there you go. Yeah. Perfect. Love it. <laughs> all right. Uh, wrapping things up, we got to talk about it. WWDC. Yeah. Did you watch the keynote at all? I listened to it. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't managed to find the time to sit down and actually watch the demo of the product, but I've heard yeah. all about it. I only mention this because I know it, it's on people's radar and people yeah. might think about it. But um, the big announcement that they made at WWDC, the Worldwide Developer Conference for Apple, is, of course, the uh, what, what has been termed as the ski goggles of loneliness or otherwise known as the Vision <laughs> Pro goggles. Um, I mention this because uh, I'm rather impressed by the amount of technology in here. But I, I am not impressed by the ta the price tag, nor am I impressed by um, the the use case. Two hours of battery life, yeah. um, not not super impressed. Uh, I don't know. So I don't know. I don't. I don't think this is going to take off. And the price tag I, alone, I think, it was thirty four hundred US in the US, which is yeah. bananas. Yeah. Um, Imagine what it's going to be like over here. You know. Oh, about a $10 million dollars. It's a laptop, yeah. right? Yeah, it's a house. Yeah. I don't get it. There's a lot of technology in there. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I, I'm pretty much the same as you. I'm really keen one day to not have to have a monitor. Like to be able to have the experience I've got here at my home, okay, on my laptop or wherever I am, I think would yep. be amazing. You know, I just want a big screen wherever I go. But um, 
but only for two hours, it doesn't help me yeah. a lot. Do you know what's crazy about this? People think that this is a translucent glass. It's, it's not. not. This, it's is pro- pro- this is projected. Yeah. It's so crazy. you're you're finally for once as an introvert, I can look at people in the eye and not yeah. feel the the crushing anxiety <laughs> of being an introvert. And not say their soul. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Um, in addition to that, they announced a bunch of other products, the MacBook Air 15. A uh, reason why I mentioned this because we use a lot of this gear ourselves at Oculus. Yeah. So we, a lot, I'm using an M2. I, I think you're using what? What are you using? Uh, I think it's an M2. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the new Mac Studio uh, using the M2 chip, which is awesome. This is a great little unit. Um, it's pretty heavy. The Max one, the Ultra, is yeah. like it's. They're pretty beefy, but they're they're great and they sit right underneath your desk there. It's awesome. The Mac Pro, of course, um, the cheese grater cheese has gotten back. upgraded as well. Yeah. Yep, yeah. So this one, I read a I read a blog post saying it was DOA um, because it may get out, it may get outpaced by the Mac Studio. There's like no reason yeah, right. to buy this. Um, the, I think the reason why is extensibility, and also yeah. you can you can pack in a tower. You can you've got all that that real estate basically. To pack and it's in got a PCI stuff. bus. It's got like expansion yeah. slots. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, proper yeah, expansion yeah. slots. And then, of course, the software side of it, new OS uh, uh, updates and including uh, Sonoma. So there you go. So, yeah, I just thought we'd wrap up with that one because I know it's relevant for folks who are curious about that sort of thing, but mm. um, definitely stuff to keep track of. So anyways, that about wraps it up for this edition of Deploy on Friday. Uh, Jim, any final words you'd like to impart on uh, the, the viewers? They put me on the spot. No, nothing, nothing okay. coming to mind. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, Paul. <laughs> I'm sure appreciates it. Yeah, <laughs> Neapolitan is. I got to put a glass underneath Neapolitan's nose there. So very, uh, <laughs> very docile dog you got there. He's managed to curl right up on that cushion too. It's uh, yeah. He's done well. That's, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's kind of like me after the Apple keynote. I was like, I was yeah. done. I'm like, I'm not watching this anymore. <laughs> Anyways, Three that's probably a good place. Yeah. <laughs> probably a good place yeah. for us to wrap it up. Anyways, thanks cool. a lot for joining us on this edition of Deploy on Friday. We're here every Friday, uh, sometimes at different times, but uh, we will try to endeavor to make it consistent. And if you see an article or news bit that is related to Octopus that you'd like us to cover, feel free to send us a link in the comments below. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on this next edition of Deploy on Friday next week. Take care.